A reading from the Book of Wisdom. Who can know God's counsel? Or who can conceive what the Lord intends? For the deliberations of mortals are timid, and unsure are our plans. For the corruptible body burdens the soul, and the earthen shelter weighs down the mind that has many concerns. And scarce do we guess the things on earth, and what is within our grasp we find with difficulty. But when things are in heaven, who can search them out? Or whoever knew your counsel, except you had given wisdom and sent your Holy Spirit from on high? And thus were the paths of those on earth made straight. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to Philemon. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner for Christ Jesus, urge you on behalf of my child Onesimus, whose father I have become in imprisonment. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I should have liked to retain him for myself so that he might serve me on your behalf in my imprisonment for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that the good you do might not be forced, but voluntary. Perhaps this is why he was away from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a brother, beloved especially to me, but even more so to you as a man and in the Lord. So if you regard me as a partner, welcome him as you would me. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Luke. Great crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and addressed them. If anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which of you, wishing to construct a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if there is enough for its completion? Otherwise, after laying the foundation and finding himself unable to finish the work, the onlookers should laugh at him and say, this one began to build but did not have the resources to finish? Or what king marching into battle would not first sit down and decide whether, with 10,000 troops, he can successfully oppose another king advancing upon him with 20,000 troops? But if not, while he is still far away, he will send a delegation to ask for peace terms. In the same way, any one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, good morning. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about a woman named Argyle Charles. First, isn't that just a great name? Argyle Charles. I, l I love that name. And uh, this woman, uh, she had a, a very profound and very deep impact on me um, as a newly ordained priest. 
Um, I, so when you're first ordained, you're ordained uh, kind of at the beginning of the month in June, but typically your assignment doesn't actually start for a couple of weeks. And so I'd, I'd been a priest for a couple of weeks, but this was literally my first day at St. Gerard as their new parochial vicar. And uh, I had gotten there in the morning and all my stuff was still in boxes, even in my office. And uh, I w had this appointment with our sacristan uh, to go over like sacraments and how to say mass in the church, because uh, I had never done that before, um, at least not at St. Gerard. And so uh, I was down there with our sacristan kind of going over different things and where things are kept and all these kind of practical details about the mass. And our secretary comes down and she says, uh, listen, we just got this uh, emergency call coming in from the hospital. One of our parishioners is dying and we need a priest to go down there. And my first thought was, well, shoot, let's go find a priest. And I thought, oh, you're, you're talking about me. Like, I got to do this, <laughs> right? Um, so, so I'm just like, okay, uh, I, I need my oils, I need my book. I do, and so like, it was kind of funny. I had to have somebody drive me to the hospital. I didn't know how to get there. Um, and I, I suppose I could have just looked it up on my GPS, but I also wanted the chance to like look through the book and make sure I knew how to do the sacrament right because, again, I had never done it before. And so I get into the hospital room and there's this woman, Argyle Charles. She can't speak, she can't eat anymore, her body is shutting down. It's the first time I ever got to meet her. It's the only time I got to meet her. And I, forever, Argyle Charles will be the first person that I anointed. And she died about a half hour later and, um, She'll be forever the first funeral I ever had the privilege of presiding over. And in that moment of entering that hospital room, Argyle taught me more about the priesthood than probably most of my years in the seminary. Right? Because if you look at my calendar that day, it didn't say anoint Argyle Charles at 11 o'clock in the morning. It didn't say that. In fact, it had an appointment on it. It said, I got to be in the church with our sacristan going over the mass because that's very important. And yet, even though my calendar had me doing something different, I was where I should have been in that particular moment on that particular day. And in that moment, you start to learn that so much of the priesthood is being invited into these moments, most of them moments of deep pain and suffering, right? these intimate moments of death and loss, of, of tragedy. And what a privilege that is, because in that moment, Argyle and her whole family, and her whole family was there, Argyle was like 98, and so she's got her, her children, her, her grandchildren, and some of her great-grandchildren all around the hospital bed. It was a beautiful, actually, scene. But what she, she taught me is that this, this privilege of being invited into this moment she, in that moment, her family in that moment, did not need Paul Erickson, but needed Father. And that is when I knew for certain, deep into my bones, that every sacrifice I had made to be there was worth it. Every single one was worth it to live that moment and to be the one bringing Jesus into that moment because that's ultimately what they needed. They didn't really need me and ultimately they didn't even really need Father. What they needed was Jesus Christ to be there in that moment of suffering, to be there in that moment of pain and to help Argyle Charles prepare for that transition from this world to the next. And every sacrifice that is required of priests I thought was worth it in that moment. And from that moment forward, 
I, I can't tell you how many different moments I've been invited into that just make all the sacrifices worth it. And this is ultimately, I think, what Jesus is talking about in the gospel. I mean, it's not whether or not you're a priest or not, at least not at the beginning, right? At first, it's just if you're going to be Christian, there's going to be a sacrifice. There's going to be something that you... What it means to be Christian, I, I can't always just do the thing I want to do the way I want to do it as I want to do it, right? What it means to be Christian is that I have to orient myself towards Christ. And there's going to be a, a certain suffering. There's going to be a certain thing that I have to give up if I'm ever going to do that right. And then it's the vocational call, whether it's to the priesthood or to the marriage life. I'm sure those of you who are married understand that there are sacrifices that involve, that go into being married. There are sacrifices that go into having children. Right? This is not something out of the ordinary for, or some kind of exceptional thing. Every ordinary Christian is going to have to count the cost of what it actually means to follow after Jesus. Because ultimately, what Jesus is really asking for is not this bit over here and that piece over here and maybe this aspect over here, but he's asking actually for 100%. What he's asking for is every aspect, every bit and every piece of who you are and what you have. There's no aspect that he's not deeply interested in. There's no aspect that he doesn't want the invitation for him to actually have control over. Right? Because he's not going to force his control, even though he could. Right? That's, not how he, that's not how he works. He, work, he, he waits for that invitation. He waits for that offering, that offering of ourselves as the sacrifice, that offering of ourselves to him for his glory and out of love for what he has done for us. That's what he's waiting for. And it's a scary prospect to put everything we have, to put everything we are on the line. And I'm not discounting that. I'm not saying that that's necessarily an easy thing. And it's actually a very important step. If you're going to take that gospel seriously, it's an important step to take stock. This is what this sacrifice requires. This is what I actually have to surrender if I'm actually going to live that gospel out. It's important to do that. But I guarantee you, every sacrifice is worth it. The sacrifice of your heart, the sacrifice of your life in order to get the heart and life of Jesus is worth it. And this is speaking from somebody who doesn't even do it very well all the time. Right? There are a lot of aspects in my life that I'm still struggling to give over to the Lord. There are a lot of places in my heart that I still sometimes am holding back because it's a scary prospect and I understand that. But every time I'm actually able to do it, every time I'm actually willing to lay down my life and offer that sacrifice, the return on the investment is insane. If you want to think of it in terms of, yeah, of an exchange of goods, right? I offered to the Lord myself and my heart, which is broken and sinful and all these other things. And I get back His, which is perfect. And every ounce of the infinite mercy, every ounce of that infinite love is poured out upon me in its abundance, in its fullness. Right? And Jesus is willing to make that exchange. He's willing to take my heart, as kind of pitiful as it is sometimes, and replace it with his. Because ultimately what he wants is he wants to help me love like he does. He wants to help me speak like he speaks. He wants to help me act the way he acts. He wants me to live the way that he lives. And he knows that I'm unable to do that until I make that exchange. 
And brothers and sisters, we have this remarkable opportunity right now. Because that's what communion is. It's what the word actually means. And that's why we call the reception of the Eucharist, that's why we call it communion. Because here in that moment, what we have is the Lord Jesus deciding, I want to come down to you and not just be with you or near you or next to you or close to you, but I want to be one with you. And literally, all we have to do is hold out our hands. And he comes to be with us. He comes to be within us. He comes to make that exchange so that we can inherit all of those promises. But it comes at a cost. And anybody who tells you Christianity is free is selling you something different. Right? It's not. It costs, and it costs quite a bit, right? Because it's going to cost your whole life. It's going to cost your whole heart. Everything you have and everything you are is what it actually takes to just be an ordinary Christian. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you that it's worth it. It's worth the cost. And if you don't believe me, if you're not sure it's worth the cost, what I invite you to do is invite the Lord into a new place right now. I invite you at this Mass to, to take some aspect of your life that you've been clutching and been hiding and been holding back and to invite the Lord into that spot and see what happens to see if he actually can meet you in love and in mercy, to see if he can actually speak a word of peace or joy or strength or whatever it is that I need in that spot, to see if he actually is interested in receiving that place as that offering and as that sacrifice. I invite you to, to, to just give it a try, to give it a try and see how it goes. Because I know, I know I have this deep conviction that the Lord wants to be there. And the Lord has good things in store for you there. And all he needs, all he's waiting for, is that small invitation, that small sacrifice, so that he can enter in and be at work.